Ladies and gentlemen, the goal in your life is not to figure out how to be comfortable in your mental prisons, but to realize that you have the keys to set yourself free. Hey, would you like more free tips on how to be a mesmerizing leader? Then check out mesmerizingleadership.com and also hang out with me on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Tim Sure. Thanks so much and make your day a sure success. Hey, it's Tim Sure. Would you like to learn my best secrets for how to be mesmerizing? Then head over to www.survivingtothriving.me. That's www.survivingtothriving.me. I'll see you there. Hey, it's Tim. Are you ready to be inspired by the world's greatest motivational speakers? Witness history as the legends of business and personal growth share with you their best strategies for how to be profitable in our new economy. Go to legendsummit.com. That's legendsummit.com. I'll see you there. Hey, everybody. Welcome to How to Be Mesmerizing. It's Tim Schur and all. We have another spectacular guest with us today. Jay Bear is in the house. Jay, welcome to the program. Tim, thanks so much. Great to be here. I know we couldn't find anybody mesmerizing this week, so I'm going to have to make do. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, right. So for people that don't know, Jay is like one of the gurus of marketing. And he really is known for the guy who's smart, but also comes from you know a place of, of love and from the heart. Because your whole, your whole purpose is about uh, serving, not selling, right? And that's what makes you so good as a marketer. And, uh, you know, you've got your best-selling books like Utility, and you've uh, been a strategist for the United Nations and for Cisco and all these big companies. So, Jay, what, is, what do you feel for you is your personal secret to success? I think it's that I'm actually good at recognizing patterns. Mm. I don't necessarily invent concepts. I mean, I'm not a futurist. Mm-hmm. But I am good at seeing things occur multiple times and saying, you know, that's probably a trend or a tactic or a technique worth exploring. Mm -hmm. And then documenting that trend or that approach and then communicating it in a way that a lot of people can not only understand it, but put it into practice in their own business or, or in their own life. Tim, a lot of times uh, people will come up to me after a presentation. Well, they used to come up to me when I did presentations in front of actual people. Uh, and, and they would say, wow, I love that talk. And you know, a lot of what you said is just common sense. And I love to hear that. A lot of speakers might hear that and, and, and feel like that's dismissive. And I, I feel the exact opposite, right? If, if I can take what is probably a fairly complex and sophisticated concept and get it to the point where people feel like it's common sense, therefore they're not afraid of it and they'll actually do something about it, then my work here is done. Mm, yeah, I like your take on that. Um, unfortunately, common sense isn't common anymore, as people <laughs> right. say. And, uh, and so it's a real powerful skill to have in this noisy world to actually be able to recognize patterns, to notice what's working consistently, to get curious about it, and then to go down that road where it's so easy to get caught up in the millions of shiny things that are everywhere. And I think that most business owners, entrepreneurs, sales pros get caught up in those distractions. And then everybody is an internet marketer now. Everybody is an influencer right. all of a sudden. And so now you have a million different uh, places you could go for social media advice. So the fact that you're speaking in a way where they feel like, ooh, that really hits home. That, you know, that makes sense to me. I mean, it's powerful stuff. So well, how, do you, how do you stand out in a noisy world then? Well, I think part of it is, is trying to be specific where you possibly can. I mean, one of the things I tell people all the time is whether they're starting a blog or a podcast or a video series or a puppet show or a <laughs> webinar series or any sort of episodic content. And of course, there's more and more of that than ever before, including this amazing show. But people ask me all the time because I've produced, I don't know, 20 podcasts or something. Wow. People ask me, uh, hey, you know, how do we grow an audience for a podcast? I said, well, there's really only one secret, which is that to succeed, your podcast, blog, video series, et cetera, has to be somebody's 
favorite version of that in the entire world. Mm. The reason this show is successful is that for many of you listening right now, Tim's The Show is your favorite podcast on this planet. And you cannot succeed unless that is the case for some members of your audience. And the mistake that a lot of people make when they're trying to do marketing is they say, well, I don't, I don't want to disqualify any potential customers or audience members. So I want to make sure that my premise is sufficiently broad mm. so that it appeals to more people. And that is exactly the wrong approach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well said. You want your thing to be hyper relevant where somebody feels like, wow, this show or this content execution was made just for me. Yeah. Relevancy is the killer app because as we talked about earlier, there's no shortage of information out there. In fact, there is a surplus of information. Yes. So if you want to succeed with information, which is a lot of what marketing is about these days, yeah. the more specific you can be, the more you will win eventually. Mm, I love that. That's so good, Jay. That's exactly right. Uh, a lot of times, you know, who's your fa who are, who's your who's your audience? Who's your client? Everybody. <laughs> right. Any, anybody yeah. who's got money. It's like, well, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. a little challenging. Yeah, but you can't fish the ocean, right? Yeah, it's just right. too big. And so I love that. And and I've learned that, you know, from uh, trial and error as well. You know, I wanted everybody to like me. I wanted to make sure that I could help with so many different areas. And I'm finding that uh, you have to choose. And then you have to go down that line. You got to take a stand. You got to draw the line and figure out who you want to spend the most amount of time with and then talk directly to them and just, you got to let everybody else go. And uh, because you're right, you're otherwise it's, you can't compete with the world. And so uh, there's too much going on. So you talk about uh, in your book, utility, right? Y O utility. Mm -hmm. So how'd you come up with that title and, and why do you want to go that direction? Same way I've come up with all of my titles uh, in the shower, literally. Uh, I've got four, four titles all written in the shower, um, which is amazing. I should just start a service that names books while semi-wet. Um, yeah. You know, the, the, the idea of utility, and it's interesting, it's, it's a, a concept that uh, I think was very much of the moment and became adopted by lots and lots of marketing organizations all around the world as sort of their rallying cry. And, now, given the pandemic, et cetera, I think it's actually perhaps more important than ever. And it's this idea that marketing should be so useful that people would pay for it if you ask them to do so. Mm. Most marketing is tolerated by the audience. What if you created marketing that was actually enjoyable, useful, lovable, desirable? That's, that's the utility approach. A lot of companies know that it's true, but still don't do it. Mm -hmm. Because to succeed with utility, you have to A, give away what you know, one bite at a time, mm -hmm. and B, have patience. Because you're going to use that content to build an information-based relationship with prospects that will culminate in sales at some point in the future. Yeah. But utility is almost the exact opposite of advertising, which is let me reach everybody at once with a message that says, give me money now. Utility yeah. reaches a few people at a time and says, hey, let's build a relationship. But I figure some of you guys will give me money eventually, right? And, and that patience is hard for some organizations uh, to live with. So it's, it's almost like you've created a third area then. So there's branding where you're just throwing money out there and yeah. not really, you know, hoping that by building your community, eventually you get paid. Then you have direct response, which is mm -hmm. I'm going to get you right now and we're going to close this sale immediately. And then you have this other category where it's somewhere in the middle where you're providing valuable information through your advertising, yeah. through your marketing, and then building that relationship so that the lifetime value of your customer becomes exponential. Yeah, the way smart. I talk about that in the book is that branding is sort of top of mind awareness. Mm -hmm. The direct to consumer, direct response kind of side is just in time awareness. <laughs> My feet are cold. You sell socks? Awesome. Just in time. And, and I just got out of the shower. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And utility is friend of mine awareness. Oh, nice. How, how can you? How how can you build a relationship with prospective customers that is? meaningfully similar to the relationship we have with one another, yeah. right? If you want to know something like, hey, I wonder if this, uh, this kind of uh, pasta is any good, right? You're going to ask a person 
Mm. Uh, you're you're going to ask somebody who also makes pasta and that might be somebody you know, or it might be somebody you don't know. And you might consult reviews or some other kind of online content created by a real person, but brands can have that same relationship as well if they choose to do so. Yeah. Uh, it's very clever. Very clever. So, uh, you know, I'm sure you've ran across this. Uh, I pay a lot to of a lot of attention to the resistance that comes up when people are first uh, experiencing new ideas and you're saying, give away your best stuff a piece at a time. Mm-hmm. Yep. And the resistance that comes up is, well, people are just going to steal my stuff. Right. right? They're time. just going to take my stuff. And then if I'm giving them my best stuff, why would they mm-hmm. pay for it? Mm-hmm. So how would you reply? I call that the secret sauce fallacy. And there's two challenges there. One, everybody says, well, I can't tell you what I know because I've got a thing that nobody else knows how to do. I have secret sauce. The reality is I've been doing this a long time. I've been a consultant for almost 30 years. I've worked with a thousand brands and I will tell you, there is almost never any actual secret sauce. Yeah. It is all in your head, right? Your proprietary system is the exact same system your competitors have. You just change the name of it. The reality is half of your employees used to work for your competitors and vice versa. So even (laughs) if you had secret sauce, you don't have it for very long. Now, there are a few exceptions to that rule. Like one of my uh, former clients is 3M. 3M has a bunch of secret sauce, right? That is a crazy company with like 17 million scientists on staff. Like they've got some stuff nobody else has. But generally speaking, especially in professional services, you don't have secret sauce first. Second, a list of ingredients doesn't make somebody a chef. Mm, Well said. This idea that, well, okay, here's the idea. Jay, if, if if we take all the things that we know, about being mesmerizing. And we give that all away one blog post at a time, for example. Well, then people will know how to be mesmerizing. They won't need to hire Tim to help make them mesmerizing. Yeah, but if there's a prospective customer who says, you know, I could work with a world-renowned expert like Tim, or I could just read these blog posts and do it myself. Let me let you in on a little secret that's not a customer that's ever going to be a good customer for you, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? If, if they genuinely think that they can do it themselves and have the exact same outcome as they would be working with somebody who is a true expert, then they don't value expertise sufficiently anyway. And you should just give those people your information so that they will go away. Oh, that is an excellent distinction. That is excellent, Jay. Well done. Well thank, said. You, thank, thank you. Yeah, that really is excellent because... It, it flips it on its head, right? So you're no longer worried that you're going to lose somebody. You know, I've had some very, I've had, a, I had a client one time that, uh, that donated more than I grossed, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and I mean, just was very, very wealthy and, and shared a lot. And he said, Tim, I'll tell you what made me successful is how many times I said no. Not the yeses, but how many times I said no to somebody that wanted to work with me or to a partnership or to something where I knew that there wasn't going to be good value. He says, don't build a, you know, a client list of consumers, build a, li- a client list of uh, relationships and, and customers and people that value what you offer. Yeah, that, that's, that's it. So I mean, powerful. look, I've got a, a consulting firm that works with really terrific brands. Mm-hmm. We are intentionally small. We're a boutique firm. There's not a lot of us. Mm-hmm. Um, we do on average, tw- I'm going to say 20, I don't know the exact number, but it's probably 24 like big projects a year for, for big companies. Mm-hmm. So that's 24 clients a year, although some of them are repeat clients, et cetera. So let's say for argument purposes, it's 15 new consulting projects a year for different companies. That's probably about right. Mm-hmm. We get 2.4 million visitors to our blog a year. Wow. So 2 million, 399,000, 985 people take what we know for free and 15 pay us. And I'm totally okay with that. Mm, That's an excellent example. That's so good. Because the reason that 15 know about us is because the other 3 million are telling them. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's very good. So if you, so how does somebody stand out then? I mean, how does somebody, you know, really focus because now it's almost becoming cliche. I mean, I think it is, I don't know, maybe not because I'm in this game all the time you are too, but 
I would think that people would realize that serving your customers and focusing on customer service and taking care of people and going that extra step is what's going to help you succeed and stand out, right? Not, not the vulnerability, which means you have to get on camera and fall apart and start crying and, you know, or some of these other ideas that, that uh, are being taught out there. So, so what are your advice for, for standing out? What are you doing with these, with these 15 clients that uh, is causing millions of people to pay attention? I think part of it is placing the correct emphasis on retention. Mm. I mean, here we are in, in 2020, and we still in business of all kinds, small, large, B2B, B2C, doesn't matter. Universally, we put far too much emphasis on customer acquisition and far too little emphasis on customer reten uh, retention. It's weird too, because everybody knows this, like this is taught in like the first day of business yeah. that, that it's easier to keep a customer than get a customer. Like nobody will argue that. Yeah. That is unimpeachably correct. Yet, very few people actually run their business as such. They're so eager. How do we get a bigger audience? How do we get more leads, more customers, more sales? And they spend so much time, money, effort, and energy on that. And such a fraction of that on how do we keep the people who have already voted for us, already given us money, how do we keep them happy? And how do we turn them into volunteer marketers? I wrote a book recently called Talk Triggers, which is all about the art of word of mouth and turning customers into volunteer marketers. And it is uh, such a mysteriously under-discussed and under-researched part of business, everybody knows that word of mouth is important. Nobody will argue that either. Yet, and this blows me away, Tim, fewer than 1% of businesses have an actual word of mouth strategy. Hmm. Yeah, They just assume that if they run a decent business, people will talk about them. But that's not the way human beings behave. That's not how you behave. That's not how I behave. That's not how a single person listening behaves. Yeah, I've had, I don't know, like maybe... Let me think about this. I'm going to say six accountants in my professional career. I think that's probably about right. Somewhere in that ballpark. Mm -hmm. Here's a story I've never told, Tim. Guess what? Got my tax returns. All the numbers added up. That's not a story. There's no word of mouth there, right? You don't get conversational credit for doing exactly what somebody paid you to do. Yeah. So if you want to unlock your customers as a source of new customers, if you want to turn your current customers into a word of mouth engine, and trust me, you do, you've got to do something worth talking about, right? You have to, you have to do something they don't expect. And, and I would say that's the part that I think people need to be spending more initiative on is how do you take somebody who's already given you money and turn them truly into an advocate, not just satisfied, but somebody who will proactively tell your story. Yeah. Oh, that's really good. Yeah. That's uh, I mean, that's really what it's, what it takes to be able to do that. So, all right, well now you have me all curious and everybody <laughs> else that's listening as well. So can you offer uh, a tip for how to create some of these word triggers and yeah, I mean, look, your advocates? Competency doesn't create conversation. Mm -mm. That's the thing you got to remember. Competency yeah. doesn't create conversation. Yeah, if you, you, do, what, do, if you do what, yeah, if you do what you say you're going to do, you know, which you would think, yes, builds trust, but they're just getting what they feel they paid for. Yeah, it'll keep people from leaving, right? Mm -hmm. So competency reduces churn, but it doesn't create new opportunities, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? If you just suck, people are just going to leave, right? That's different, <laughs> right? But if you're if you're if you're good yeah. people won't leave but if you're good they're not going to tell anybody either because you're good right good enough is not enough right mm -hmm. so what you have to do is build a talk trigger into your organization which is an operational choice mm -hmm. that is designed to create conversations okay and i'll give you an example if i may yeah there is a, an oral surgeon in Clifton, New Jersey. His name is Dr. Glenn Gorab. Mm -hmm. And there are 415, I think is the number last time I checked, oral surgeons in the New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, tri-state area. That's a lot of oral mm -hmm. surgeons. Mm -hmm. And per the way medicine works in the United States, they all do fundamentally exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. 
same procedures, same services, basically the same office setup, and essentially the same price as well. Mm -hmm. Pretty hard to differentiate. Yeah. And most of them differentiate based on location. Who's mm -hmm. closest to your home or office? That's the guy who you're going to have do your oral surgery. Well, that's a tough way to make a living, frankly. Yeah. Glenn understands the power of conversations, the power of taking existing patients and turning them into a volunteer marketing force. Here's how he does it, Tim. So every Friday, his office staff gives him a list of names and phone numbers. And on Saturday mornings, he calls each of those people. And he says, hi, this is Glenn. I'm your oral surgeon. I understand that you're coming to the office for the very first time next week. Hey, before you get here, do you have any questions that I might answer? Hmm. Now, Tim, you're old enough, as am I, and probably many of the listeners as well, to have had, I presume, some sort of oral surgery in your life. You had a wisdom tooth extraction, a root canal, you know, whatever, right? And if you've got a good oral surgeon, they will call you the night after the surgery. Tim, how you doing, man? How's the pain? Are you bleeding to death? Those are the questions they typically ask. And that's nice to hear, but that's not outside the realm of expectations. But I can almost guarantee that none of you have been contacted by a physician of any kind before you ever cross the threshold of their office. It is simply not done. But it should be, because Glenn tells me that 80%, 80% of his patients mention that phone call when they are in the chair. And every single day, somebody calls the office to make an appointment and says something along these lines. I have to drive six miles out of my way. I have to pass eight other oral surgeons, but I want you to be my doctor because you're the one who called my friend Shirley before she ever came to the office. That's a talk trigger. That is not an accident. It is an engineered operational choice that creates conversations every day, week, month, quarter, and year. And it may also be one of the reasons that Glenn is the highest rated oral surgeon in the region and is also the only oral surgeon in practice for more than 10 years who has never, ever, ever had a legal proceeding against him. He's the only one. Wow. There you go. I mean, that's incredible bedside manner. It's incredible uh, service. And I it's mean, most, so easy. Yeah, it is. Well, most people don't even get the follow-up call right. or it's coming from a nurse or it's coming from, right. you know, somebody, uh, a dental technician. And so, uh, you know, to have that phone call. So what, what, uh, what do you say to the physician who's listening to this that says, well, I got to make, what, 40 phone calls a day now every day? Yeah, it ends up being about, because of people who have never been there before, net new patients, um, which is kind of rare in, in that business. So um, Glenn says it's typically about eight to 10 calls a week. So it's not, it's not like overwhelming, um, but it's time, right? Look, here's the thing. Business success is hard. It's harder than you think. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to get into like old man, rancid clouds kind of mode here. But I'll tell you what the real secret is. Most people who aren't very good at business are not working hard enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. You know, you want your patients to, to, to talk about you. Well, okay. You're telling me that you're making whatever an oral surgeon makes, which is a bunch. Yeah. And you can't spend two hours every Saturday calling those people. Yeah. You are choosing not to, you are prioritizing whatever it is that you're doing, as opposed to prioritizing that. And that's okay. That's your choice. I'm not going to stand in your way. But a lot of people, when they say, oh, I can't do this because, uh -huh. what they really mean is I won't spend the time to do that because yeah. I don't choose to spend that time. Yeah, I don't Look, want I, to. <laughs> I tell you, you know, people ask me sometimes like, well, you know, how did you get known in the digital marketing space? I've been doing it a long time, but I have only been known um, in the marketing space for probably 12, 13 years. And, and the, the truth is this. So I used to live on the West Coast. And this is when uh, blogging and sort of marketing blogs and marketing kind of digital thought leadership was really, really important. And there were hundreds of marketing blogs and 
and, and bloggers used to compete for notoriety and traffic and all those kind of things. It's a little bit, bit of a different world now. This is all pre-podcasts, pre-YouTube, et cetera. Yeah. And what I would do is I would get up at five in the morning every day and I would read, at least scan, 40 different marketing blogs. And I would find a topic that I was really interested in and I would sit down and I would write a long, like two, 300 word comment on that blog post. I would publish that comment and then I would go around to all the other blogs that were talking about similar things. And I'd leave another comment with a link back to my comment. And I did that every day. And then I would write a blog post of my own, a thousand words on my own blog eight times a week. How did, how did I get known? Well, I think I'm modestly good at this, but I also worked my ass off and worked way harder than most people would be willing to. And that's not an accident. Yeah. Yeah. That was, so the lesson is that you do need to work hard. You know, a lot of uh, internet marketers are telling you they got that secret sauce and just for five grand or 10 grand, you know, you're going to be able to have lots of money and lots of free time. Right? And so, uh, you know, and it really is a myth that if you're going and, you know, in the perfect relationship as well, well, it's very hard to have balance in all those areas because you can't give a hundred percent in everything. And so, you know, it's, we could talk you know, about well, how to you know, develop that's a, let me, and let me just, let me just be honest about that, Tim. Yeah. You raise a good point. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, uh, Teller, the famous magician mm -hmm. has a great quote, which is magic is simply working harder and longer on something than anybody would reasonably expect. Yeah. And, and that's absolutely true. And it's one of the ways that I have become successful, but it is not without a price. Mm -hmm. Have I spent as much time with my family, my friends, my loved ones as other people who made different choices? Absolutely not. Has my effort put into those kind of things robbed my wife and kids of my presence and my, and my time? Absolutely. Yes. Um, so, so it, I don't want to make it sound like everybody can or should make the same choice. It's a choice I made and I'm okay with it. But I do understand that if you're gonna, if you're gonna put that kind of effort into something, right, that, that comes at a, a cost of other things, right? You can't do everything. Everybody's only got 24 hours. So I just wanna be upfront about that. And I appreciate that. You know, it's very authentic to share that because people don't usually talk about that side of the business or that side of success, of the sacrifices and what happens with your family, what happens with your marriage, what happens with friends, right? Because, um, you know, when you're really standing out in that way, you don't have as much energy. And so I'm not hanging out with, you know, all my friends are my, you know, business friends and colleagues yeah. and other achievers, right? And so... Um, in my family, I make sure that uh, I'm there for all the special events and I spend a lot of time, uh, but there have been countless hours where I was working or getting one more thing done. I think the important thing that you said is you, you work hard, but you also need to know what you're working hard on. Yeah. A lot of times we waste time because we think we have to have all the social media. I can't tell you before I hired some people and, and then went back to doing it on my own and then stopped doing it, uh, how much time I spent posting four times a day on <laughs> yeah. Facebook and Twitter yeah. and LinkedIn and YouTube yeah. and, you know, and every TikTok and everywhere else, you know, and, and it was so time consuming and I yeah. would stop because I would do it for a couple of years and it, you know, I, I got a few more fans, but it didn't give me any more cash and, and it didn't feel like it was producing the outcomes that I want. So you got to work smart and as well as hard. How, how would you uh, suggest that somebody know what to work on when it comes to their marketing? It's the challenge in marketing because unlike a lot of other parts of business, there's always something new and always something more that you could do. Yeah. And we go back to my accounting example, like how many new accounting opportunities are there? Mm -hmm. I mean, a little bit tax law changes. Like, well, I guess I could do this. I guess I could write my dry cleaning off differently or whatever. But, but in marketing, there was a literally, especially digital, which is my area of expertise, 
Yeah. There's literally something new every week, like, yeah. like meaningfully new that, that we actually need to consider doing for clients yeah. and for ourselves. And that's really hard because you very easily, and a lot of our clients um, are in this situation when they, when they start to work with my firm and I, they're in a point where they view activity as a success metric, mm -hmm. right? We're just doing more is categorically better. And of course it isn't for the reasons uh, you so nicely articulated, the reality, though, is that for every person in every organization, the pie chart of activities is different. Mm -hmm. Now, there are, there are some similarities, right? If you want to be a business-to-business -business sort of thought leader expert, I would argue you should spend more time on LinkedIn and less time on Facebook and Instagram for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, you know, so there are some patterns. But you really want to, to test different executions and tactics and say, is this having a desired effect? Is it, is the juice worth the squeeze? And if it is, do more of that. And if it's not, stop doing that. Um, the, most people are afraid to stop, right? Yeah. They're, they're like, well, I've already started it. And so now I'm sort of pot committed to use a poker reference. So if I stop, then I've wasted all that time I put it in there before. And, and that's not yeah. really true, but I, I see that psychology a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the opportunity cost. So I love that phrase that you said, uh, is the juice worth the squeeze? <laughs> That's a good one. I credit that one to my friend, Joel Book, uh, former right. head of marketing strategy for uh, Salesforce. Oh, well done, Joel. So, so when you take on a new client and you're taking a look at all their stuff, where do you start? Depends on the kind of project, but generally where we start is two places. We will look at their website mm -hmm. uh, and then we'll look at their social media mm -hmm. to say, what story do you tell about yourself when you have a captive audience? And then what stories do you tell about yourself when you have an audience that is very much not captive? Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we'll see a lack of alignment there uh, just in sort of what, why does anybody care that this business exists? There's a lot of other detective work we do. I think we have something like 50 or 60 different software programs that we use in our practice to analyze people's digital success factors in a whole bunch of different ways. And so it's a, it's a fairly significant uh, kind of CSI, yeah. uh, you know, type of work that, that we do before we provide recommendations to, to corporate clients. But those are the places we look first, like, you know, what do you tell people when you have them on your site? And what are you trying to tell them when you're trying to get their attention on a place like Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter, or Instagram, what have you? Very good. Yeah, I've seen some of that software. It's extraordinary. I mean, you've got heat signatures on where people are roaming on your website. Yeah. I mean, it's mm -hmm. amazing. A little scary. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Though. So uh, what would you say is the balance? Um, because people are taught you have to tell your personal story about why this is important to you. However, you have to make it all about your customer and you've got to use you language. Mm -hmm. So where's the balance in there, Jay? Uh, I think the best way, it's funny you asked this question. We just had a meeting about this for a client not an hour ago. Ah. Relevancy, right? Yeah. Relevancy. It, it's not either or. You, you mm. want to think about it in terms of sequence. Mm. Every buying decision is made in an order, right? It's the classic marketing funnel. Mm -hmm. Awareness, interest, consideration, purchase. Nobody cares about you and your story mm -hmm. until they are sure that you sell a thing that they want and that you have demonstrated that you are actually good at that thing. Mm -hmm. So at best your personal story is the third question they ask. As a practical matter, it's probably more like fifth or sixth. Mm -hmm. um, this idea that you lead with who you are is totally wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't care who you are until I know why we are even a match in any way, shape or form. Yeah. And, and so you kind of, we have a process that we use in the firm um, called topic archeology. span and we, we use a five by five by five framework. And so it works like this. Let's say you have five kind of key audience archetypes or personas to use marketing language. So five customer types. And then you've got the classic five stages of the funnel, awareness, interest, consideration, purchase, and, and advocacy. For each of those five stages, 
each of your five customer types are going to have approximately five questions that they need to have successfully answered before they will move to the next level. What does Tim sell, right, is may, way more important than who is Tim, right? And so you've got to make sure that you're answering these questions in sequence. And, and, and some of the art of, of content marketing and website design, et cetera, is presenting information to potential customers in a sequence that most closely matches that natural order of inquiry. The problem that most people have is they've got a website or a bunch of content or a bunch of videos or a bunch of whatever that's, that's like random, right? And, and so here's a bunch of things. You can consume this in whatever order that you want. And, and all that does is confuse people. So can you go through that list again? So it's awareness. Awareness, interest, mm -hmm. consideration, mm -hmm. action, advocacy. That's the kind of classic five stage journey. And then you want to understand like what questions do people need to have answered in their head to get to the next step? Mm, that's very good. So now you have created a structure for people to follow. So you can, so anybody that's watching or listening, you can actually go through your materials and say, are you, have you created the appropriate awareness? Do yeah. not assume that people already know who you are and what your product is. Uh, they, most of the time they don't, right? We tend to, especially assume, now things yeah. have changed so much, right? I mean, for sure. one of the things I talk about in my keynote presentations now is that since the pandemic, nobody knows nothing about nothing, <laughs> right? There's a huge, yeah. huge uncertainty gap yeah. between customers and companies now bigger than it's been since the internet was invented yeah. because the processes and procedures and policies and programs that your company uses to sell stuff mm -hmm is probably different than it was in March. Yeah. And there's a big lag between customers understanding that. And the example I used him is um, a couple months ago, I went and got a haircut for the first time since the pandemic. And look, I'm 50 years old. Like I had a pretty good, I'm like, hey, I know how haircuts work. Nope, do not, not anymore. I had to get all these questions answered. Is the haircut place still open? Didn't know that. The lady who cuts my hair, does she still work there? Didn't know. Where do you park now? Parking meters still work? How do I pay? Are the appointments the same length? Do they still sell shampoo? Do I wear a mask? Does she wear a mask? And on and on and on and on. And that's true for every business in the whole world. Nobody knows nothing about nothing. So the one thing you've got to do right now is re-educate your customers, right? And that is kind of circling back. The way to do that is with content and, and with sort of that utility approach. Mm, that's really good. So now you're, bring, <clears throat> you're bringing it home. Right. With all right. Now we know the structure with your awareness and interest and in, and in all that. And then we start to focus on. All right. Now we got to re-educate people on where we're at, what's going on, what we see is happening in the future, what actions they need to take now, so that you are being seen and, or viewed as a trusted advisor. Right. You're providing upfront value, and then you're going to walk them through. You know the approach, and I think that that uh, can give people something to hang on to now. Because when we talk about marketing, I mean, that's such a broad topic that people often don't know what to do. So I really appreciate that you're being very uh, strategic in your approach. I'm telling you everything I know one bite at a time, as I mentioned earlier. <laughs> one bite at a time. That's awesome. So, wow, that's excellent. So who is, uh, you know, maybe a role model for you as you were coming up in the profession? Uh, a, a couple different answers to that question. You know, as a as a leader of teams and a manager, I was really fortunate to have a number of great uh, bosses and supervisors in my young career. You know how uh, in sports, a lot of times you'll see an ex player or whatever become a really successful coach or manager. And it's amazing when you sort of peel back that onion, how often they played for great coaches and managers, right? And so they sort of picked up little things along the way from each of these. And, and that's sort of how I feel uh, my career has gone. I was really fortunate um, to work for some extraordinary people um, when I was just a kid, really. Uh, Wynn Holden is one of my mentors who... Um, was, was one of my first bosses and was the publisher of Phoenix Magazine and, and um, ran some radio stations where I worked as a marketer and, and subsequently was the publisher of Arizona Highways Magazine for some 25 years. And he's an incredible guy and, and so good with people. And I learned a lot of lessons there. 
if in the marketing industry, because there's so many topics, it's almost impossible to pick one. But I guess I would, I would say like so many others, um, I, I would look at Seth Godin, partially because Seth is really good at not pigeonholing himself. Like every time he writes another book, it's about a different type of marketing. And I think that's really uh, admirable and aspirational. I try to do the same in my own books. Uh, and I would say probably the Heath brothers, Chip and Dan Heath, who are uh, business school professors uh, and and have a terrific understanding of the Venn diagram between consumer psychology, behavioral economics, and marketing. Um, you know that it's it's so important to kind of understand those those relationships. And I think sometimes marketing becomes too academic and too mathematic driven when it's really all about ultimately it's about emotions and, and that gets overlooked too often. Yeah, I mean, even when you talk about great mentors, you're not talking about how amazing they were with the spreadsheet, right? You're talking about how they were with people, right? How they made you right. feel, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's so true. Yeah, uh, that's really clever. So, um, you've worked with some huge companies, you know, mm -hmm. and and like with the United Nations, yeah. what's that like? What was that like for you to, to you know, you realize that? Uh, so that project, we. Uh, worked with them for a year or so uh, to improve the social media globally for the division of the UN called FAO, F-A-O, which is the Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, they have a pretty important mission statement, which is to eradicate world hunger. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, that's pretty high stakes. Uh, and, and so yeah. it's like, oh, wow, I'm just trying to get people to click on a blog post, but all right, whatever. Uh, so it's, it's like, man, all right, you guys are doing you guys are doing good work here. That's the big uh, leagues. That's the big right. leagues, man. So it was cool. It was it was really interesting uh, for a couple of reasons. One, their team uh, is so smart and competent and capable. Uh, that's not always the case with organizations we engage with. And when you think about kind of a quasi governmental or governmental entity like the UN, my assumption and and I'm embarrassed about it now was that, oh, these guys are going to be kind of career bureaucrats sort of, you know, masquerading as marketers and they're not going to be very good at this. And we're gonna have to teach them the basics and nothing could be further from the truth. They were really mm -hmm. smart and really sophisticated. It was a pleasure to work with them. And, and then the global nature of it, right? I mean, so yeah. much of the work that we do just as a practical matter is North American based. Um, and, and here you're like, how do we do better social media in Ethiopia or what have you, which is a really interesting project. The highlight of that one though, Tim, is I got to go to Rome where this particular um, UN division is headquartered. And I got to go to Rome and do a presentation on how to use social media uh, to mobilize young people around the world to help eradicate hunger. And it was in the big auditorium there and all the member countries brought delegates. Oh, wow. And, and so it was like the Mo Isley's cantina scene uh, in Star Wars, right? Because we had, <laughs> I had like shakes there wearing, you know, everybody was kind of wearing their national garb, right? It was like the <laughs> opening <laughs> ceremonies. <laughs> yeah, it was like the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, right? And it was, uh, it was high pressure. Like I've given, I don't know, 800 speeches in my life at least. Wow, um, that's, that's impressive. And that, and that was one that was really, really nerve wracking. I'm like, okay, this guy is the, you know, ambassador to, you know, the Philippines, yeah. like this speech better be pretty good. And it was yeah. made even more stressful because my daughter came with me. Uh, I brought her out to, <laughs> to hang and, and, uh, Which is like, awesome. Man. Yeah, it was fun. Uh, but that was a really memorable project. We, that was one of our favorites. We're, we're really lucky with the clients we get to work with. Um, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't trade it for anybody actually. Yeah, that's incredible. Well, you kind of answered one of my next questions because I was going to ask what's one of the coolest experiences you've had. I mean, when you get yeah, to- Yeah, that's definitely one of them for sure. Yeah. yeah. Do you have another that comes to mind? Um, or maybe the coolest person you ever met? I mean, oh, geez, coolest person I ever met? I don't know if I can answer. Um, well, one of them. So, okay, this happened last week. I didn't meet him, but it's a pretty cool experience. So, yeah. well, I'll okay, I'll answer this two ways. Okay. Uh, Coolest person I ever got to spend legitimate time with um, is Ron Howard. I was the MC, really MC for a big IBM event uh, probably five six years ago. Um, it was one of the signature events. It's ten twelve thousand people or whatever. So I was the MC, and Ron Howard was uh, one of the uh, 
keynotes, but he wanted to do a fireside chat. Mm -hmm. And so I was the one who got to interview him. And the night oh, before, awesome. uh, just hung out in his hotel room for like three hours, uh, just kind of shooting the breeze and kind of prepping for this conversation. And what an amazing oh, wow. guy. I mean, such a nice man and incredibly, incredibly smart and kind and like the, so down to earth. Yeah. Uh, I, I may have had the bigger ego of the two of us, which is um, <laughs> remarkable considering he's won like 400 Oscars and I'm just a dude um, with a podcast, <laughs> right? So uh, it was awesome. That was a really... <laughs> a really memorable one. But last week, okay, so I'm doing a, I just did a keynote last week for Cheetah Digital, which is a big um, digital marketing company. Yeah. And they did a, a virtual summit, obviously virtual. And somehow, I don't know the exact details of this, it doesn't matter, but their CEO or CMO or somebody in the organization knows Tommy Lee, the drummer from Motley Crue, sure. former husband of Pamela Anderson. And, you know, yeah. It's Tommy, it's Tommy Lee, right? He's as rock star as rock star gets. Yes. Well, they had Tommy Lee actually do a promo video for my speech uh, and my signature thing, my talk trigger, if you will, is I always wear um, crazy plaid suits on stage. And in fact, meeting planners get to pick out which suit I wear. That's part of the deal. <laughs> uh, and so Tommy Lee was in his own plaid suit, like making fun of me and this whole thing. <laughs> it was awesome. I'll send you the link to the video. Uh, oh my God, is, I gotta see that. Yeah, it is totally a highlight. Oh, and and uh, oh, my amazing. my team saw it before I did and they were dying laughing. Oh my gosh. So to be, to be uh, sort of pilloried by rock star Tommy Lee wow. in a promo video is definitely, uh, definitely one I won't forget. Dude, you won. Yeah. You just won. Yeah. I like okay, it. everything it's else fun. is a bonus. Yes. <laughs> yes. You hung out in Rome and you were introduced by Tommy Lee. So you yeah. had both spectrums. <laughs> yes, that's it. That's it. Well, it's funny, you know, Tommy Lee is known for making videos and somebody said, oh, a Tommy Lee video. Are you sure you want to star in that? I'm like, different kind of video. Uh, well, he was wearing a suit. So, you know. Yeah, he's wearing something. Thank God. Thank God he was. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh, that is great. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, wow, that's pretty impressive. So, uh, Jay, tell me real quick where people can find your information, how they can. Uh, well, know, I would just search Tommy Lee doing. plus Jay Bear is the first thing I would do. Uh, <laughs> Plaid suit. Start, start there. Uh, my, uh, my site uh, is jbear.com, B A E R, jbear.com. Uh, and then the site for the firm, which has 3,000 articles for business owners, managers, people who want to be better at marketing and customer experience, is convince and convert.com mm, convince and convert.com so obviously everybody should be heading over there because jay knows his stuff he's an authority a global authority on uh how to get your message out in this world and so it's very powerful and now you have a lot of cool podcasts too you've got the social pros yeah, podcast shows, yep. now all about social media and then uh standing ovation which is all about speaking. And so yeah. that's very exciting. We're going to make sure that we have the show notes for uh, or the links in our show notes for that. Yeah. So tell me just real quick about, um, about the uh, standing ovation podcast. Yeah. Each week I interview a well-known busy keynote speaker and the way it works, Tim, is we open the show and we play so the audience can hear it, their signature story. Oh, that's beautiful. So what's beautiful. the story that they typically tell on stage that's kind of the opener or the closer? And then we spend the rest of the show dissecting, discussing, and diagnosing that, that story. How did it happen? How long have you been telling it? How different is it now versus when you started, we're telling it five years ago? Why do you say it this way? Um, have you changed the laugh lines? And, and it really is a deconstruction yeah. of a signature five minute story. And there's not really a show like that out there other than this mm -hmm. one. Again, going back to the specificity yeah. thing we talked about at the beginning. Uh, and it's uh -huh. such a fun show to, to, to record because uh, I'm fortunate that I know a lot of incredible keynote speakers and, and it's, yeah. it's just amazing to hear them kind of break down their stories and their approach and their techniques. And I knew this before I started recording the show, but it really reinforces how there's so many different ways to skin a cat, right? There really is no, there is no right way. Uh, and it's just neat to see how different people go about it. 
Yeah, that is brilliant. I had that idea at one time as well, and now I don't have to do anything with it. I'm just <laughs> there you go. I'm just going to subscribe to your Problem podcast. Solved. Thank yeah, you. that's happening today because that is brilliant. I love the idea of how you share it and then how you break it down. That is awesome. And, and again, for everybody listening, go and subscribe to that standing ovation. J Bear, B A E R, J Bear dot com and, and check out standing ovation because uh you don't have to be a speaker to be able to learn how to tell a great story if you want to strengthen relationships you want to build rapport you want to become a stronger influencer you want to have uh, more charisma then uh you're going to learn the secrets for that in jay's program and his for podcast sure. so that's awesome jay one last question for you. you've learned a lot you're 50 i'm 50 as well we've both been on this planet for five decades now uh, if you could go back and talk to little Jay when, uh, when you were maybe like 10 years old, what advice would you give him? Probably to be more comfortable with risk earlier on. I'm a seventh generation entrepreneur. Um, wow. my son's an eighth generation entrepreneur. So, you know, whether or not I was going to start my own thing wasn't really ever a question. I never had a conversation with my family about, you know, what you should do. It's just sort of like, that's what we do. Yeah. Uh, but I waited, I didn't start my own company until I was 30, mm -hmm. which is probably eight or 10 years longer than I should have waited. But I had a pretty good job. And I was like, well, why would I want to risk that? And then I realized ultimately that that was kind of a ridiculous uh, way of thinking. And, and so I probably would be farther ahead of the game now if it would have started earlier, but I was scared, frankly. And uh, I would have tried to talk myself out of that uh, if I could have. Yeah, well, good for you. I mean, we all start out scared and then we figure out how to uh, go from from fear to faith and empowerment. Or, or, we, or we just stay scared, either way. Eh, sometimes, <laughs> yeah, either sometimes, way. Yeah, sometimes people stay scared and then use it and try to channel that adrenaline, and that yep. anxiety. Yep. So what, what's it like being growing up seventh generation uh, entrepreneur? You know, I, I, was, I was doing an interview the other day and somebody asked me, when did you develop your approach to really taking care of customers. Yeah. And I said, I didn't because my grandfather's grandfather's grandfather was a business owner. Right. And so this idea wow. that you should learn to take care of customers, like I, I, it was just in the oxygen that I breathe. Like I never would have even dreamed of a different way. Uh, you know, to me, sort of the, the golden rule applied to customer relationships was just that, I mean, it was gospel. Uh, so it, it, I never learned it. I just, it, I just was since the day I was born, really, at least I was always around it. And my dad had started, my dad started five companies of his own. Um, and, and so I learned the ability to sort of by osmosis, really, yeah. um, to, to, not be afraid of sort of picking a different horse, ride that horse on a different horse over here. And it's one of the reasons why I, I'm not um, afraid to change topics, right? So even we talked about Seth Godin and how he always changes topics. I try to do the same, right? So I've got one book about social, one book about content, one book about customer service. I've got one book about customer experience yeah. where most people, as you know, Tim, they say, I'm a speaker about sales, right? And they write eight books that are all pretty much the same. They're all about sales, which is a different yeah. twist on it. And I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to keep keep moving. And I think I sort of picked that up um, from my family. Yeah, that's brilliant. And it reinforces that there are many different ways to express yourself. You know, anytime somebody tells you, no, you can only write those eight books about sales. That's just one opinion, right? You yeah. should be focused, you know, in the beginning. However, you know, if you have, if you're multi-talented and you have the courage to express or want to go down another route, take the road less traveled, do it. You know, yeah, I mean, I sort of look at it upside down, right? So when I go to write a book or write a speech or create any sort of meaningful new content, I don't think about what do I know? I say, what do people need to know that I can find out and then deliver to them? That's literally how I do it. Um, and, and so the way we come up with ideas for books is everybody on my consulting team is required every Friday to send to me a list of questions that our actual clients have asked. Mm -hmm. And then I cobble those out together and literally look for patterns. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, well, okay, if these customers who are the biggest companies in the world yeah. don't know the answer to this, yeah, pretty much nobody knows the answer to this. <laughs> so right. then I'm like, well, I could figure out the answer to that. And then I do, and then that's a book. 
What if somebody says, um, you know, I keep asking my audience, you know, for questions and stuff. Nobody's asking any. Yeah, you can't. If you ask them, to, if you ask them they won't tell you. Mm -hmm. You have to just listen. Mm -hmm. They will tell you. Mm -hmm. But they won't tell you when you ask them. They'll tell you when you're just talking to them. Yeah. Right? It's just sort of a tactical difference there. Yeah. A very important one. So, Jay, this has been absolutely mesmerizing. You're just a, a delight. So thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom and uh, all these really smart, creative strategies to help people to uh, share their message and, and feel, you know, leave their mark in this world. So thank you so much. My pleasure. It was a blast. Thanks for doing it. Congratulations on the show. It was an honor to be part of it. Yeah, thank you. So there you go, everybody. Holy cow. Jay was incredible. Oh my gosh. So many golden nuggets. You need to go back with pen and paper and watch this again or listen to this again and take lots of notes. Then share it with your marketing team. Share it with your leadership teams because Jay laid down so many golden nuggets. It's just absolutely extraordinary. So we're going to have the links to all his stuff. Get his book, Utility. You can find it on Amazon. Subscribe for his social pros and his standing ovation. I'll be doing that myself today. I'm going to be binging the standing ovation podcast and, uh, you know, apply what you've learned and it'll make your business and your life mesmerizing. Hey, it's Tim. Are you ready to be inspired by the world's greatest motivational speakers? Witness history as the legends of business and personal growth share with you their best strategies for how to be profitable in our new economy. Go to legendsummit.com. That's legendsummit.com. I'll see you there.